Shrek has to be one of the most underrated movies of all time, right? You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Got game one of the conference finals in the books with the uh, Celtics smashing the Cleveland Cavaliers, I guess somewhat surprisingly. I did pick the Cavs in six. Um, that can still obviously occur, but that was a huge, huge performance from Boston in Game 1. And now we eagerly await Game 1 in the Houston Golden State Series tomorrow. But in today's podcast, we're going to be going back to the 2017 NBA Draft again and looking at picks 25 through 28. We're going to be wrapping up the NBA Draft Recap Series this week, uh, going into the second round from tomorrow's show onwards, and then going into the Season Recap um, preview, preview, review series podcast by looking at each team. The NBA lottery is this week as well, so we'll have all the lottery news as well uh, in those podcasts. So lots of stuff to get to as we head into the NBA finals and NBA draft season. So Michael Bolton, let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it. Indeed, we will start with the twenty fifth pick in the NBA draft from 2017 in today's show. It was selected by the Orlando Magic and then traded to the Philadelphia 76ers. And that pick was a guy who I'm undoubtedly going to pronounce his name incorrectly, Onzesh Pesesniks, who is a uh, big, big man, a big Latvian center. Seven foot two, 22 years of age, obviously didn't come over to the NBA this season. Played in Spain for Gran Canaria, uh, sorry, Herbalife Gran Canaria over in Spain this season. So we don't have any NBA stats to go on, but he's a guy I think has got very limited potential. Don't get confused by him being a white guy, a white seven foot two player, a white seven foot two player from Latvia. Yes, there's already one of those in the NBA, and his name is Christos Porzingis. Porzingis. Poshesniks is not Pozingas. He's not him at all. Yes, they're from the same country. They are the same height, but they are not the same player. Poshesniks is an interior banger. He is a decent rebounder. He is not a three-point shooter. He is not the level of rim protector that what Pozingas is. So he is not like, this is not the guy you look at and go, oh, it's another Pozingas. He is a high-efficiency shooter around the rim. He takes his shots from in close. And that's what he does, and he rebounds. Whereas Pozingas has a lower rebound rate. He's a high shot blocker who takes a lot of three-pointers. This is not the same players who, again, do not get that impression that because he's a white seven foot two center from Latvia that he is Pozingas because Pesesniks is not. Let's look at what he did last season playing for Gran Canaria. He played 50 games, only started 10 of those, and played 17 minutes per game. So it's not like he was playing a large role. Averaged 7.5 points and 3.8 rebounds in those 17 minutes. Let's double that to get an idea as a per 34 minutes. So we're talking 15 and 8, which are not bad numbers. He only averaged half a block, which would be one block per 34 minutes, half a steal, one steal per 34 minutes, and shot 57% from the field, 60% from the free throw line, and 20% from three on just 0.4 attempts in those 17 minutes per game. So again, a very limited three-point shooter. All of these numbers are almost identical to what he did in his draft season of 16-17, playing again for Gran Canaria, where he played 16 minutes per game and averaged 7.2 points and averaged 3 rebounds and averaged 0.7 blocks and you know, took 0.36 three-point attempts and shot 66% from the field. In fact, a few of his numbers dropped. His block rate dropped. His field goal percentage dropped in between 16, 17, and 17, 18. So nothing that I look at and go, well, you know what? This is real. I can't wait for Pesheshniks to come across. He had an okay PER of almost 17. He had a positive net rating of, of plus five over the season, a good true shooting of 60%, a block percentage 
percentage of 2.8, which is okay without being spectacular. A usage of right on average at 20%. So these are all okay sort of things. But again, we're talking about a guy whose rights are owned by the Philadelphia 76ers. And I'm not sure if you're aware, they have a guy called Joel Embiid who's their starting center. They have Dario Saric, who plays some minutes at center. They have Rashawn Holmes, still under team control for one more season. They have Jonah Bolden, who is going to be coming across next season as well, who can play the four and at the five as well. So Pesheshniks, and I don't think Pesheshniks is coming across for the 17-18 season, so I wouldn't be thinking we're going to see much there. He does not project as a starter in the NBA. He projects maybe as a Salah Mejri type of a player. That's sort of with a, with a lower block rate. I can see him as being that sort of a player, a guy who might get himself into 10 minutes per game. I see very little fantasy upside for him. I see very little real-life prospects for Pesechniks. Uh I, I don't see him as, a, as an elite-type prospect by, by any stretch and definitely not an elite fantasy type of player. But he was selected in the draft, so we're going to talk about him. And nothing that we saw from him this season gives me any reason to think that he is going to become this you know, guy that can develop into multiple different areas of the game and be a real fantasy uh, contributor. But again, it remains to be seen. I don't think we see him in 17, 18. He is already 22 years of age. I think he'll have one more year in Europe. Uh, he might get traded. His rights might get traded by the Sixers, but I just don't see them having the roster space to bring him across for next season. Um, let's move on to the next pick, the 27th pick, and that was the Portland Trailblazers. And with that pick, they selected Caleb Swanigan out of Purdue. Now, we hear the maxim thrown about a lot of the times during Summer League. Ah, oh, it's only Summer League. Don't get excited, right? I feel like that's becoming less and less true. Big performances in Summer League are, in in large part, they can be indicators that the player is is a solid player. We saw the Don, Donovan Mitchell, put up big numbers. We saw Jason Tatum look fantastic in Summer League. In previous years, Carl Anthony Towns and Christos Porzingis have looked really good at Summer League. But being good at Summer League doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a good NBA player. Caleb Swanigan looked great in Summer League. He was first team all Summer League. And he was shit ass this season. The pick at the time made very little sense. I didn't see it for Swanigan as being an NBA player, especially in Portland. And he ended up playing 27 games, just seven minutes per game, and was out of the rotation for nearly the majority of the season. Now, earlier in the season, he was well ahead of Zach Collins on the depth chart, but it didn't take long for Terry Stotts to go, you know what, this guy just can't cut it in the NBA at this point in his career. He averaged 2.3 points and two rebounds in those seven minutes, half an assist, 0.1 blocks, shot 40, 67, and 13% from three for a true shooting of 45%. Obviously, none of those numbers there are spectacular. He ended up the season as the 473rd ranked fantasy player, which clearly is not very good at all. If we have a look at where his two-week rolling average is, and as I mentioned, to begin the season, he started off, he was getting some minutes, and he had a couple of moments, and you can see him pushing to the 300s there, but then dropped and was consistently under the uh, the top 300 level and uh, yeah, didn't have very much to say, and, and, and was limited quite a bit and didn't play a huge amount down the stretch there. And as you can see, you know, in the overall ranks graph, it just continually plummeted as he got worse and worse and his playing time uh, dropped as the season went on, as he was, I guess, found out, so to speak. His best performance for the season was a game in Houston on the 5th of April where he had 10 points in 18 minutes on 75% shooting, but contributed in no other categories. 10 and 4, he had no steals, no blocks. In fact, the last time he had a block in an NBA game was the 13th of November, where he had two blocks, and he only had a block in one other game, and that was against the Pelicans. And that was part of the reason why I wasn't all that excited with him coming in, is he was a, uh, he's a power forward who didn't really protect the rim, didn't really you know, spread to three very well, wasn't a great defender. I just didn't see what he was bringing into the modern game, and that's pretty much what we saw from him this season. His per 36 numbers, strong rebounding numbers, 10 rebounds per 36, 12 points, 2.7 assists, half a block and 0.9 steals on, again, those fairly putrid shooting numbers. 
that uh, that we uh, referenced earlier, the 40, 67, and 13%. Yeah, nothing overly exciting to look at there. We're talking limited minutes, 189 minutes he played overall, a PR of 7.5, uh, yeah, negative win share per 48, massively negative offensive box score, plus minus of negative 6. And defensively, he held up okay as a 0.6, and on-off of negative 2.9. But again, it's very, very limited sample size when we look at what Swanigan can do. I don't think he ever can become a starting caliber power forward in the NBA. Um, he's not stretchy, although guys can develop that stretch. Al Horford, Brook Lopez, Marcus Gasol, Paul Millsap. A lot of those are centers, but some of them are power forwards. These are guys who didn't really have that three-point shot early on. And he has shown a, an okay willingness to take those threes. 13% of his shots came from three. He only hit 13% of them. But he showed a willingness to take those shots. It just wasn't um, it wasn't awesome in terms of him being able to get out there and actually hit those shots. Now, on cleaning the glass, they have a metric called uh, the points per shot attempt. And he is in the one percentile, the first percentile, meaning that 99% of all NBA players, uh, big men, are better than him at that category, which is clearly not the area you want to be in. And for a guy that's you know, doing that and not handling the ball as much, the fact that he's in the seventh percentile of turnover percentage is a huge, huge worry as well. N yeah, didn't finish at the rim well. And by well, I mean he shot 52%, which is in the fourth percentile of big men. Horrendous. No mid-range shooting. 27% on his mid-range shots. Nothing good really there at all. Could not get the blocks up. 1% block rate, which is in the 27th percentile. Honestly, just not a lot there. The big positive we can look at um, look out with Swanigan is his rebounding. That was that was strong. 77th percentile for defensive rebounding rate, according to Clean the Glass. Those are those are pretty strong. It's uh, pretty strong numbers. A defensive rebounding rate of over 22%. Look, these are these are okay numbers. But in terms of what he's going to be able to do, uh, fantasy wise and in the NBA, I just don't see him as being ever anything more than a backup. Again, especially with Al Farouk Aminu, the chief. Haven't played this for a while. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. With him there, with Nurkic likely back, with Zach Collins around, Ed Davis, uh, with the fact that you can play Mo Harkless at the four, I, I just don't ever see Swanigan as ever being a player who's a, a large-scale contributor. He's already 21 years of age, which isn't ancient, but it's not like he's exceptionally young. Um, I, I still think there is a, a long way to go for Caleb, and, and I really have my doubts that he does ever get there. In fact, over the last three months of the year, he only played in 12 games, didn't only only got to 10 minutes in one of those games, and even you know, towards the end of the season, didn't even play in the final, uh, in the, well, sorry, in the playoffs, he only played one game as uh, some garbage time against the Pelicans, and only played one minute in the season finale against the Jazz after the Blazers were locked into, uh, locked into their uh, playoff spot, not necessarily their seedings. Was given an opportunity early on, didn't take full advantage of it, and I don't have huge faith in his game translating to the modern NBA. Again, everything can change. I just don't. I don't really see it with uh, with Swanigan at this point. Let's go on to the next player, and this is a player where there is a lot more positivity to get to, and that is, of course, the future NBA MVP, Kyle Kuzma of the Los Angeles Lakers. Now Kuzma is the opposite side of things to what um to what Swanigan in is in the fact that he was also dominant at Summer League, but he continued on that good play throughout the NBA regular season, not to the same level and not to the same level that he was able to do it in NBA preseason. And that's part of what I was always talking about him with him in preseason is he wasn't going to be able to shoot at such an extraordinarily high level. Now, he shot the ball well still. There's no doubting that. But he was a guy that was going at you know, 55% for like two months and shooting 45% from three when he had shown no ability to do that in his years in college. And that did you know, predictably drop off. He played 77 games for the year, 31 minutes per game, which, again, nobody could have foreseen him playing this large of a role when he was drafted. 16 points and 6 rebounds, excellent return. 2.1 triples, 1.8 assists, 0.6 steals, 0.4 blocks on 45, 71, and 37 for a true shooting of 55%, just a smidge under the league average value, a usage of 23% as well. So there's a lot of good positive things there for Kuzma. The thing is, he's about to turn 23 before next season starts as an older, uh, an older rookie. 
So how much better does, does he start to get here? We did see you know, when he was given larger usage roles, he was able to step it up into the in those roles. And over the last 13 games of the year, he played 38 minutes per game and averaged 20 points on a usage of 24%. The efficiency actually rose. He was 46 from the field, 75 from the line, and 37 from three. So he was able to maintain some some decent consistency towards the end of the season after starting off the year yeah, really, really hot. We can have a look on his rolling two-week average in in general, you see some big spikes there, some some large dips where he, over the course of the end of January, start of February, he was down yeah, outside the top 300 as his shooting fell right off. But overall, he was a fairly consistent player and brought it back up towards the end of the year when there were injuries to Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram and he was shouldering a much larger role. Now, he had his own ankle problems at the end of the year. But again, this Lakers team could look exceptionally different next season. Just Julius Randle return. Will Brandon Ingram be healthy? Most likely. Will Lonzo Ball be healthy? Most likely. Do they bring in free agents? So there's a lot of unknowns here with Kuzma and how how his role is going to play out. He played off the bench toward or for the majority of the season with a Brook Lopez, Julius Randle starting lineup. Will that continue? He played at some small forward. His role is extremely unknown heading into how the next season looks. With his overall ranking, you can see there's no significant trend here. Started off you know, really strongly in that top 100 zone, peaked up to about top 50, dropped back off, and then you see it rose again towards the end when those guys got injured. But I think that that zone between you know, January and February is probably a more realistic expectation of who he is in a, as a player. A guy that's 100 to 130 in fantasy ranks in that sort of an area rather than those top 50 peaks that we were seeing from him uh, earlier on, which was again fueled by some really unsustainable shooting. He was uh, he had huge, huge performances consistently, but you know, one of those things I talked about is so many of those big games came on really, really exceptional, exceptional shooting performances, things which are hard to contain. Now, he ended the year as the 105th ranked player overall, which again is well above where anyone could have expected him to be. But as I mentioned with Kuzma multiple times during the season, when the shot wasn't there and when the usage wasn't there, he's, the other parts of his game aren't there to, to balance that out. Per 36 minutes, he averaged just 0.7 steals and 0.5 blocks. They are very, very small numbers. The efficiency, he is a negative in field goal percentage and free throw percentage. Two assists per 36 is subpar. Scoring was great. Three-pointers, good contributor there, but you can find that in many different areas. Rebounding, fairly solid, but still not not overly awesome for a power forward. You know, 6.3 per game is not is is pretty good. It's not overly awesome though. It's just above average. And realistically, when we look at Kuzma, he had three categories that were positives, points, threes, and rebounds, and none of them had a standard score of over one. So for as good as Kuzma was, and he was good and he was well above expectations, he wasn't a dominating fantasy type player yeah, great value off the waiver wire, fantastic as a last pick. That all worked out, no doubting that. But I think the reputation that he had based on hot shooting, the fact that he's a Lakers player, the fact that there was a lot of uh, a lot of Dutch rudders being given by Lakers fans to Kuzma as the second coming. He has a ton of defensive issues that he needs to work on. He has a ton of offensive stuff. His scoring ability is great. Like really, really advanced as a rookie. You could not have pr predicted anything better from him there shot the ball well, did a lot of stuff footwork-wise, moves-wise that was awesome. It's just the other parts of offense, the passing, the defensive stuff where he does really need some work to be put in. A PER of 14, a true shooting of 55. So both those numbers marginally below average. Negative box score plus minus defensively, offensively, overall. Below average win shares per 48. And all these things, I think, tie into what I actually saw from Kuzma this season. Really good scoring, but fell, fell, fell away in many other areas. And he was actually a negative for the Lakers on the court. A negative 2.3 net rating, a negative 1.8 on off, which aren't terribly negative. But for a guy that was acting like, or sorry, or playing like, uh, a really important piece and one of the better players on this team. You would have hoped to have seen more from him uh, in terms of positivity or, or being able to impact wins. And it wasn't necessarily the case for Kuzma during the season. His uh, advanced stuff and shooting numbers over on cleaning the glass, 
he looked he looked pretty good in most areas again. Shooting percentages for a forward in the in the upper half of two point percentage and three point percentage, all that stuff was strong. Um, it needed to work on his threes. Hit only took eight percent of his shots from the corner and hit thirty eight percent of them, which is well below average. But had you know, above average on his seventy six percent on his mid range shots, where he where he hit forty two percent of them. That's a little bit of a concern. Um, 37% on his threes, really strong, really subpar at the rim, 59% only. That is something he does need to work on. And for all his you know, advanced moves and, and finishing, he didn't finish all that well. He still has a long way to go in being able to finish at that level. And as I've touched on before, the block and the steal rate, really, really subpar. Rebounding, not too bad. Um, he's, his foul rate was... Um, was decently high as well. That's something that will go down as uh, as he improves throughout his um throughout his uh, career. And he also wasn't a good free throw shooter, and he wasn't all that adept at drawing fouls. So there is a lot of room to to grow with Kuzma. Um, I'm not not sure he he does it. Where where does he become? Or how does what level of player does he become? A lot of it's going to depend on what happens. But I could make a realistic. Well, maybe not realistic. I, I could say that I think that this could potentially be Kuzma's best NBA season within reason. I think there is a chance of that. It's probably a lower than 20% chance, but it could very well be his best NBA season. Because I, I don't see the natural growth in playmaking in defensive stuff. Now, if I had to say, if someone said to me, Josh, is this going to be his best season or not? I would say no. He probably will be better. He'll probably have a season where he averages more than 16 points and plays more than 31 minutes per game. But depending on what happens with free agency, is Randall back? Because he's clearly going to be behind Randall. Can the Randall Kuzma front court work? Maybe, but defensively, that could be a real issue. Does LeBron, Paul George, Demarcus Cousins, who knows what the Lakers do in terms of bringing guys in? There's a lot of uncertainty. Is Kuzma better suited to play the three, but Brandon Ingram's there. Is he best as a sixth man? I think he might be best as a high-minute sixth man who plays 29 to 31 minutes per game throughout his career. For fantasy, he's going to be drafted clearly next season. I think he's going to be overdrafted. I think I can see people taking him in the 60s or 70s would be my guess, and I feel like that's going to be too high. Um, Again, just because he's going to need the assists, blocks, steals, and efficiency growth to really jump into that. And I think the efficiency can grow. I think we might see a 2-3% free throw percentage rise, maybe a 1-2% field goal percentage rise, but still he came in shooting well above expectations in field goal percentage and three-point percentage. So even if that dipped next season, I wouldn't be 100% surprised. But a great season from Kuzma, another really exciting piece that the Lakers have got. I think some of the hype on him, as I've alluded to much of the time, has been over the top. But he is a clearly a solid player who can be a, a, a quality offensive starting player, but has a lot of holes to fill defensively. And that could, in time, limit what he is able to do from a real-life perspective. And then that transfers across to a fantasy point of view as well. The last player we're going to touch on in today's podcast is a guy that we barely saw. And that is Tony Bradley of the Utah Jazz. The Jazz traded up to select Bradley out of North Carolina. And we just didn't see him play really at all, even with Rudy Gobert out for big chunks of the season. He played only three minutes per game, nine games for the season, and averaged 0.9 points and 1.2 rebounds. Shot 27% from the field. Yuck. Um, Didn't miss a free throw. Uh, Had a true shooting of 34%, which is as horrendous as it gets. A really limited sample size of uh, Tony Bradley for the year, just 31 minutes in total, including the playoffs. I can bring up his graphs and we can look at them. There's very, very little to see here just because he didn't play very much and really in that 300 range most of the year in terms of ranking uh, in a two-week average but ended up dropping down to outside the top 500. That's how piss poor he was in terms of his numbers. He was the 517th ranked player when all was said and done. And a per 36 basis, he averaged 12 and 14, strong rebounding numbers. Did not have a single block all season. That will obviously change at some point in the future. And shot horrendously, uh, 31%. Again, numbers which will likely get better. 
we can have a look at the advanced stuff. But it's such limited sample size. There's not a lot to take away. You're just horrendous um, box score plus minus stuff and win shares and PER and true shooting. Weirdly, the team was 3.9 points better off when he was on the court versus on the bench. But he was behind Gobert and Favors and uh, and Epeudo as well as the cent- in the center situation there. So he's got a lot of room to grow. But he is still you know, decently... Um, Young, he's still only 20 years of age and won't turn 21 until into next season. But I think more indicative of looking at Bradley is having a look at what he was able to do playing for the Salt Lake Stars in the G League, where he played 24 games and 30 minutes per game. And here we've got a better indication where he averaged 15 and a half points and he averaged 10 rebounds. So the strong rebounding, that actually is maybe not real, but you looked at his NBA numbers and go, well, he rebounded well. Yeah, and he rebounded well in the G League. So that's a positive. He shot 58% from the field, clearly better than the 30% he shot in the NBA. 81% from the line, which ties in. He didn't miss a free throw in the NBA. Again, and he took one or two, but 81% is excellent for a big man. 1.3 blocks. That's getting somewhere. It's not perfect, but it's 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 positive. 1.3 assists, 0.7 steals. They're okay numbers in the G League, and I think the Jazz would be pretty pleased with the fact that he had a plus 15 net rating, a PER of 21, a true shooting of 61, a block percentage of almost 4%. These are are positive numbers for what he was able to do in the G League. Now, of course, Rudy Gobert is in front of him, so he's not taking that role anytime soon, but Derek Favors is a free agent. Is he back in Utah? We don't know. Epeudo, does he return again? I think Bradley's probably looking at three years to maybe become the, or two years to maybe become the backup center. And he could be a guy that comes in in 20 minutes, shoots 60% from the field, gives you six points, six rebounds, 1.6, 1.7 blocks. And in some fantasy situations, that could be useful. It could be streamable. I actually think he's probably got a higher ceiling than Swanigan in Portland, um, just because um, his ability to protect the rim, he's, uh, I guess he plays... Uh, he's big enough to play as a center, as Swanigan I don't think can necessarily do that. Uh, Bradley is, I'm just going to bring up his height, I think he's 6'10 or 6'11. Um, he is, he's 6'10, so uh, he's, he's got decent wingspan as well. I, I do think that there is uh, something there to become a backup at some stage, a primary backup, um, but it's not happening next season, I don't believe, and I don't really think he's ever going to be challenging to become a standard league relevant fantasy player. Could be an interesting stream for rebounds and blocks, maybe along the lines of another Portland guy like an Eddie Davis sort of a player. Um, the high efficiency stuff is something which we've seen in the G League. And that does give us uh, a level of confidence. He, he did a little bit back in North Carolina. But remember, this is a guy who didn't even start games for North Carolina, played only 15 minutes per game uh, and blocked 0.6 shots in his time in those 15 or six, yeah, 15 minutes per game back there. So, There's still uh, obviously a lot of room to grow for Tony Bradley, but I thought what he did in the G League was a positive. Um, Whether that can continue to develop, I'm not sure. I won't be thinking that happens next year, but there is an opening if Udo and Favors aren't there that maybe they think that Bradley's ready to step into that role. I don't think that's the case. I don't think they'd feel confident with that, but he showed a bit in the G League and there are a few things that can translate into becoming decent enough for Tone Bradley but very very little NBA experience this season that we have to go off that does it for today's show guys again we're going to do I think three more of these covering the last two picks in the first round of the next one and that's uh, Derek White and Josh the Hitman Hart and then going through the second round is probably not in as much detail with the second round as there's a few of those that didn't play at all in the NBA and in Europe, but looking at about eight to nine second rounders per show. And then at the end of the week, we'll be doing um, NBA season recap podcasts, starting with whatever team got the number one pick in the draft lottery, which is coming up in a couple of days time. Leave a review for this show on Apple Podcasts. You know I love that. Five-star rating, review. Find us also Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube where you should subscribe. You should leave a thumbs up and you can leave a comment as well. And check out the rest of the Locked On Podcast Network, including Locked On NBA, which I recorded today, speaking about the Rockets, previewing their series with the Warriors, and talking about the coaching changes in Toronto and in Atlanta. We are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.
Frank Kaminsky. <laughs>